Hi there. Uh, I think this is going. Yes. Uh, this is Dr. Coates. Uh, it is February 21st, and this is a lecture on, um, I think I've called it, poetic imagery versus visual poetry. Um, I've more or less given up on trying to figure out how to get this not to be out of sync. Uh, it's above my pay grade, and I, I apologize for not having worked it out. Um, I'm pretty sure that if I had more expensive software, uh, it would all work out. But um, I'm also pretty sure that I'm not ever going to do that out of pocket. So uh, it is, it's going to be shareware programs until VCU comes up with a big thing of money for me to, for me to buy Camtasia. Um, but on the other hand, YouTube ought to work. I don't know what to say. So I don't know. I mean, I still recommend Catherine's idea of having... The, uh, the transcript up in front of you and maybe just listening to me. Um, but if you like to see me, for whatever reason, here I am. Uh, this is a coffee mug that has the chemical symbol for caffeine on it. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. And here we go. All right, so anyway, in a sense, today's lecture is a disambiguation exercise. You know, if you go on Wikipedia and you've put in a word that has multiple different uses or that might have a movie named after it versus the definition versus, or the book, versus the film that was made off of it, you know, and then the disambiguation thing will lead you off into different entries. Um, image and imagery uh, is an example, or are examples, of a word like that that really needs to have those different pages, um, especially if you're talking about it in, in terms of its relationship with poetry. Because most people use that word without having first thought about what images are, or what it means to represent an image within a poem, or how weird it is that this term imagery or image refers simultaneous, simultaneously to the thing being represented and the representation itself. I think it's worth our time to clear up this mess and in doing so to set, the, set up the rest of the semester with its emphasis on imagery and the visual aspects of poetry. So partly the confusion over this term arises because some critics like to use image as a synonym for metaphor, which is sad because metaphor is such a useful and precise term and imagery seems to be less so. But like metaphors, which have a vehicle which, which exists on the page and then the tenor, which is not, uh, it's something that the reader infers that the vehicle has been substituted for. I hope we can agree that images have both a textual and an extra textual element. There's a trigger on the page that evokes a picture in your mind. And then there's the picture in your mind that the language conjured up, but which you know is, is not actually part of the, uh, the textual matter of the poem, whether or not, you know, it's not on your screen, it's not in your book, it's not on the piece of paper. Um, it's really not even a function of the words, except for so insofar as the words uh, caused you to think of something. All right, and it's an important distinction. It's the first step towards a clear definition for imagery, since we still need to be able to point to something on the page in order to avoid falling into uh, what the new critics called the affective fallacy, the thing I talked about in module two. Not only do you need to be able to point to a trigger, but you need to be able to rationalize its mechanism. So how did you come up with that image, right? How do you know that you should have come up with that image? How do you know that you haven't just imported something willy-nilly uh, because that's the, that's the way you roll, right? So for example, if, uh, if I read the following line from Shakespeare's play Hamlet, and mermaid like a while they bore her up about the death of Ophelia uh, late in the play, and I point to the word mermaid, but I am unable to explain how I got from that word to a 2006 Dodge Ram extended cab pickup. I am clearly doing something wrong, right? Because that it's kind of against nature to think of that based on that word. On the other hand, it would be unspeakably literalist of me to say that you, you, are not allowed to think of anything except what you see on the page, which is to say words, right? You're supposed to be thinking of not just the words, but you know what what they mean or what their assembly into sentences and then a poem is supposed to do for you, right? It's not poems exist as more than just the uh, the words on the page. It's the uh, the interaction between yourself and those words, and what happens in your brain that we're really interested in tracking. So um, clearly, poems do their work by suggesting through language, voices, situations, actions, and scenes. And you're doing what you're supposed to do as a sensitive reader if, when you read a poem, you try to imagine in your head what is happening. So let's define the imagery of a poem as the creation of an image in the reader's mind by a poem, and an image as the paratextual visualization of a moment within a poem. Now by paratext, I simply mean something that exists in parallel, like alongside uh, your reading of the content of the poem. 
So in other words, if you were to read My Last Duchess by Robert Browning and write down a plot summary at the same time just to keep track of all the characters, that's paratext. And ditto for finding an image on Flickr or Tumblr that crystallizes how you're imagining a particular part of the poem, right? So let's say you're reading an Arthurian romance and there's a description of Guinevere, right? As someone with hair and a dress or something like that, you know? They may not go into a huge amount of detail, but you are still imagining somebody, right? And your picture of that character is gonna influence how sympathetic you are to her and her plight, um, you know, how, how freaked out you get when she's, you know, endangered by a dragon, that kind of thing, right? So if you're not doing a very good job of, uh, if, you're, if you're not doing, if you're not expending effort trying to imagine what these people look like or, or um, you know, what an object, how an object appears, um, to, to some extent you're not really investing enough energy into the poem and it's not going to have as much of an effect on you, um, right? And so that's what I mean by a sensitive reader. So anyway, um, images are places where the poem surrenders some of its agency to you to imagine what's going on. And it can be both a welcome opportunity for the reader to insert herself into the interpretive act, you know, a part of the normal process. It's like, well, finally, I get to have some agency about, you know, in this case, what one of your looks like, or, um, you know, I can, you know, not, uh, unlike with the, uh, the sort of paratextual summary of what's going on, or just like, you know, desperately trying to uh, keep track of what's going on, and, you know, who said what to whom and when, and, you know, who had the candlestick in the, in the ballroom at what time during the night, that kind of thing. Um, it's instead, you know, I get to choose what, what this particular candlestick looked like, you know, whether it was bronze or, you know, had like a little felt bottom on it, you know, if the, if the poem doesn't supply that, that doesn't mean that you're barred from, from doing that, as long as you're still trying to imagine a candlestick rather than the Dodge Ram. So, anyway, um, for other people, though, imagery, or at least that, that's sort of the limited freedom that the reader has to imagine something, uh, it can also be a threatening sort of indeterminacy, since no one can really be quite sure that all of us are imagining the same picture as we read a, a text, right? And this is part of the reason why we talk about texts um, and try to rationalize why, you know, like my version of the candlestick is better than your version of the, or, or you know, like what, how we both came up with our, our two different versions. As your instructor, uh, what's important to me is that you can explain where your image came from and rationalize the, the causal trigger, right, that you're able to point to something in the poem and say, this is why I'm imagining this candlestick in this way, right, um, in ways that make sense to, to another reader, to, to me, to, to your peers. Um, and it's also important to me that you accept that mental pictures that cannot be rationalized and verified should be rejected by all of us, including you, right? Never, never cling to an image that's been discredited uh, because there is no trigger. Um, unless you can, you know, obviously justify, you know, why the rest of us missed the trigger or something like that. So hopefully the process that I've just described sounds a lot like our illustration assignments, uh, the ones from the second week of every module in this course, and helps provide a rationale for why I assigned them and what they're designed to accomplish for you. I set them up so that it's most natural for each group member to provide an image that speaks to a different moment in the poem. After all, each of these poems usually has a lot of different moments. So that means there's a lot of opportunity to illustrate those different moments. And, you know, if, if you, instead of, you know, picking a different one of the 30 different possible illustrations, and instead, like, three of you all focused on the same image, then that might seem like you're just arguing with each other or that it's impolite or rude, um, unnecessarily confrontational, that kind of thing. Um, but it's possible that you could do that, and it would certainly be valuable if you chose to. I'm not saying that you should, I'm just saying that, that it would be possible. And at the very least, what these illustrations will do is they will allow all of your classmates who illustrated a different poem when it comes uh, time for the next exam, uh, you know, to go through there and see how you illustrated it. And I think especially for those cases where they might have been thinking of something much different as they read the poem, it would allow them to compare their interpretation with yours, right? Uh, not, again, in, in a competitive way, but just to try to understand how all of us come at these things in different ways and what it means. In some cases, that's just to explain to ourselves how we're this learning community where everybody learns in a different way and we all have different backgrounds and we bring different things to texts. Um, but also in order to get better and better at articulating why we saw what we saw. Um, right? And even if you're still convinced at the end of the day that, that your image is better than one of your classmates, um, not that your goal should be to like pummel them into submission <laughs> because your image is much better than theirs. But even if you are, even if you, you are still convinced that yours was better, uh, it's always going to be a good process to, you know, um, a good practice to go through the process of demonstrating or articulating to yourself why you chose what you did. Um, 
because sometimes we do these things intuitively, and if you're not aware of, what, of the decision, decisions that you make, then it'll be harder to catch yourself in a, in a, in a wrong turn, um, or just to talk to someone else about poetry. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not that one of you is going to be right and the other one's going to be wrong, although as with my Dodge Ram example above, it's always a possibility. Um, it's that it's always useful information to realize how other people examine the same text. They must be interpreting it differently than you if they picked a different image or one that you're just like, where did this come from? And if you hear them out, you at least have the opportunity to be critical and reflective about your own reading practice. So the next thing we should do is to try to acquaint ourselves with how we're imagining what's going on in poems in very precise terms. So let's stay with Sailing to Byzantium for this week. And I'll ask you on the Twitter, um, on the Twitter posting, I'll, I'll do this like as soon as I as I post this, this lecture, actually. Um, I'll ask you to provide me with images for what the speaker looks like in the last stanza. Remember, at this point, he has decided to leave Ireland and sail to the holy city of Byzantium, which doesn't exist anymore, because it really only existed until about 300 AD. So it doesn't exist. Um, and so it really can't be sailed to, unless it's the Wayback Machine rather than an actual boat. Uh, and then in order to get there, get to Byzantium, he has to address some sages and ask them to consume my heart away, which sounds like it would hurt, and gather me into the artifice of eternity. I'm pretty sure by now everyone realizes that the artifice of, of eternity is a figure for the poem itself. It's a metaphor for the poem sailing to Byzantium, artifice of eternity, because what it does is it records Yeats's consciousness, the speaker's consciousness for all time, and he may die, and he actually has, he died in 1939, um, but in a sense he's always speaking to us because the poem is, is in present tense. He's, that, that particular guy, you know, it has been uh, addressing audiences with his gripe about old age and how it's, uh, you know, older people are not as appreciated as younger people are, or by the young, um, ever since he published it in 1928. And it will keep on going, addressing us, as long as this poem is read. So in that sense, it is the artifice of eternity. Um, but that, you know, calling it a figure for the poem doesn't actually help us visualize what this guy looks like now, right? Um, it's a figure for the poem that the Yeats-esque speak, speaker is writing, and potentially what he will become, right? And that's certainly one way of reading what the speaker becomes once he gets on the boat, but it isn't enough to predict what he looks like. And here is the stanza, again, I encourage you to look at this on the transcript. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing, but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make, have hammered gold and gold enameling, to keep a drowsy emperor awake, or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. He's outside of nature. He's a natural, uh, but he has a body. What does his body look like? Uh, tweet me with an image uh, attached to, to your tweet, please, sometime before Friday night at the end of the day, and then respond when I redirect those tweets. Uh, I've got a, I, I have what I what I consider to be a really kick-ass image <laughs> that uh, you know that at least crystallizes for me what what Yates looks like. Um, and it also happens to be from a, a movie that I remember from growing up, although I, I suppose nobody really respects anymore because it's old-timey. Um, but um, I also want to see what you're thinking, right? And imagery is a great way for us to see each other's thoughts. So let, let's, let's you know, take this in the, in the spirit that the class wants us to take it. And remember, every week you need to tweet three times for full participation credit. Okay? Uh, I like it be at least once after Wednesday. But failing that, try to make up for it between now and Saturday night, or Friday night, excuse me. Um, and I'll, I'll help you out in that by posting this a little bit earlier than I usually do. So one last thing, uh, we need to distinguish between imagery that we construct in our minds and as we read poetry and the visual aspects of poetry, uh, which like words are the visual features that can be seen on the page and really you can't get away from. Visuals are unlike images because they are irrefutable evidence. It's there, right? Everyone looks at it and even if you choose to do something else with it in your mind, you can't get away from the fact that the poem was you know, construed in some sort of visual arrangement, all right? So that's the, like the words on the white space and the effect of that white versus the usually black print, all right? Um, they're more a function of the form of the poem than up to the reader to supply. So consider the, uh, the poem that I'm attaching in the email that I'm sending this out in, and I'll also put it on the Blackboard site, uh, which is by the very religious English poet George Herbert, which is called Easter Wings. It's written in 1633, and it's the earliest truly visual poem that I'm aware of. So look at it, maybe even pause this for a second and then come back to it. I'm not suggesting it's like a magic eye, but did you see it? It's a bird. 
It's, a bird. it's in the shape of a bird. This is a preview of coming attractions. Uh, we're going to be reading lots of poems that look like, you know, either the things that they're about or, you know, have been messing around with the way that you're reading them in order to make a, a visual point. Um, and that this and the next module are designed to get you to be thinking about imagery, the, uh, the pictures that you construct in your mind. Um, but the, uh, the last module is going to be about truly visual poetry. So we're, we're doing the uh, imagery sort of hardcore for the next two modules because I want you all to get better and better, uh, get into better and better practice, interpreting poems by as associating images with the text, getting better and better at describing why you did that, and to reject bad interpretations in favor of the better ones. Only then are we going to explore those texts that use their visual textual bodies to conjure images for the reader and make the experience of the text a forced response to their visual nature, which is just no getting around it. Uh, but it's also fun at the same time. I hope you agree. So thank you for listening to this, and I look forward to seeing your tweets, which probably will have images of things that are made of gold, considering the four mentions of gold in that last stanza. So have fun with that. Bye.